Introducing Michael, he has spoken at several SIPOBs about wonderful world of leadership and his own experience of this. And to me, when we come to this environment, because right now, you know, people used the term VUCA before about the unpredictability. Well, to me right now, it's VUCA on steroids. And the question is, in this high level of an unpredictability we're in, does the same paradigm of leadership apply that applied before or not? And I think as you'll find out from the next half hour, Michael is probably one of the best people to speak on this. So without further ado, Michael, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Nikita. I really um, appreciate your kind words. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to talk about actually what is going on in this world in leadership and um, actually move away from maybe our sort of um, biases towards what we feel leadership is about and also maybe move away and actually maybe ask some curious questions about the narrative that's getting played on social media about what what leadership is because if you go off the narrative of what social media is then you're just going to have some really fun places to be but i would argue you're actually going to achieve anything or um be able to lead in this uh, ever-growing complexity or chaos that we we find ourselves in um and I, I know from my experience of being a soldier that we we tend to find a lot of our influence on leadership as as we're growing up as we as we go, I say as we're growing up, as, as we're growing up in our organisational um, footing. I remember as a young soldier, I used to look at the um, the the corporals and the, the sergeants, the sergeant majors, the uh, probably not so much the officers, bless them, but the soldiers, and uh, look and see, wow, that person's great, and we get a lot of influence from them. But when it comes to our time to be a leader. I don't think we really necessarily have that time, that break to say, is that the right approach that we need to take in this, in this change, this new situation that we find ourselves in? And I found that from the time when I first was a leader, that the complexity I, I saw was vast. From the days that I then left to the day that I first took sort of a command post, it, it completely changed. Our beliefs about what we needed to do or needed to be to win changed. And I use that word, that term win, because really that's what we're trying to do in an organisation. We can't kid ourselves that we're not. Uh, we still have that task that we're very much focused on, but we do have these other elements of um, complexity, friction that we have to deal with. And, uh, and that's a real thing. The question we must ask ourselves, actually, is it a new type of leadership that we require in this ever-changing world? Is it a new approach that we need to, to take? Is it now that we need to move to digitalization, or do we need some new thing that's coming up? And you see that there's always new things coming, but we never asked ourselves actually what's the right situation in, in, in this, this current time we're coming in. And COVID has given us a great platform because I know as myself as organizational psychologists, I was warning people of this complexity, this chaos that we, we will find ourselves in and we have to start being comfortable in. And it was there very much, nah, it's okay, Mike. We're, we're pretty comfortable, you know what I mean? We, we're working to the, the next financial year and that's fine for us. And now people are, um, are seeing themselves in a completely dis, uh, different situation. They find themselves come unstuck rapidly. Those key pinnacle people that they relied on, mainly the leaders, that they, they that knew the answers, these SMEs that they just held everything on, it soon wasn't enough. The resilience of the organisation disappeared overnight. And they're still trying to figure out, actually, how do we sense make and go into this, uh, uh, and leave through this complexity? What is it that we need to do differently? And that's the word differently. And I may be able to dissuade the, the thought that maybe it's not something that we need to do differently. It's those good ground root solid stuff that maybe we're, we're not doing. And this complexity has amplified those shortfalls in what was already there and available. So we... We go through it, and I'm going to share a slide now because, and um, forgive me, this goes wrong. As I told you, I am a soldier, 
So technology normally isn't my uh, first port of call. We're going through and this is Kniff and Framework. And this exemplifies exactly what we should be doing, what we should be looking at and noticing that there's the difference between the predictable world that we found ourselves and found ourselves comfortable in and that we still view our world as, as predictable and that's what you want it to be. You only have to look at the narrative. As soon as um, uh, COVID happened, people straight away were talking about the new normal. Leaders are still striving for this utopia of stability that does not exist. There are some stuff that are obvious. They are predictable. And we do know when we have plenty of efficient ways to deal with the, the predictable. But what we're not comfortable with, and we need to start getting comfortable with, is working in this unpredictable world where it lives complexity, chaos and disorder. And actually think about, actually, what do I need to do differently? What assumptions did I hold that would work in the obvious world is not necessarily going to work in a chaotic world? And how do I need to move away from this bias towards the, the great man theory of leadership and confidence? Because we know that as soon as chaos happens, confidence isn't going to get you to the, to the end state that you desire. But we still do look at our, how we review and how we get our leaders. We, they're all pretty much biased to confidence. Majority of people that come in to be leaders have got there through the fact that they've either been there for two years and they now deserve a promotion or that they've done really well on a job interview and we know how um, successful that is as a predictor for success. But it's still that confidence that blinds us. And we know that the, the follower leader relationship is hardwired. And then when we do go to chaos, our natural reaction is to look and go, okay, what's happening next? And it's in this chaos that um, isn't helpful because our natural reaction to working in this chaotic or complex is to add more layers of process, is to, is to actually gain more control, take a more command and control approach. But we know that stifles what we're trying to do because these, this world, especially over here, well, in the complicated to the chaos, so, Three thirds of this model is all about the area teams, is realizing that humans are finite, leaders are finite. We need to set the conditions to unlock the, uh, the cognitive capacity of everyone in the team. And there's great initiatives. And when I reverted back to the narrative of social media, if you look at the social media narrative, it's just that as long as you're being nice to people and you speak last, then you're going to set the conditions for people to um, feel that they can have a voice. But they're forgetting important things, certainly like context, that direction. Leadership is a balance. Mm -hmm. We need that balance between, yes, the, the skills, the soft skills that we talk about, about engaging people and about how to um, uh, connect people on a human level. But also, we're starting to move away and forget about the actual hard skills of leadership, about that direction. If we want leaders now, we wait until they're at senior leadership before they get any form of training. Leadership needs to be at every level. We need to introduce leadership at the very, very um, tactical level um, of the organisation, all the way through. It needs to be the, 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 the one thing that will, will follow people through. So we're actually setting leaders up for success rather than um, failure because it's going and working in this complex and chaotic environment um, being nice even though it is a good trait we want is is, is not going to be the the whole answer you need to be able to lead people through this but as i said when we're in this complexity in this chaos we we lead ourselves to frictions Frictions that exist, frictions that are natural. When we look at the external frictions to the internal frictions to the limited knowledge and the, the own individual agendas, the emotion and stresses that happen in organisation, it causes frictions. And one of those frictions is around the difference between what we expect our actions to achieve and what they actually achieve. And our unhelpful reaction around that is to gain 
tighter controls, greater processes. We confuse action with KPIs and matrices and we, um, we stifle people. We put so many uh, layers of bureaucracy that we suffocate people. We don't make them adaptable. And as you can see that years ago, and it was the same in the military as people are finding now, it used to be that the bigger that you are, the stronger you are, you were going to win. But that isn't now. It's the most the ones that are more adaptable are going to win. If you make yourself so process driven and bureaucratic, you're going to struggle to adapt because chaos is going to come around the corner. And if it takes you three, four, five, six months to make a decision, because you've got to go to such and such board and such and such sponsor group to, to this and oh, we can't possibly make a decision now, so we'll delay that to a month. The, the, the problem and the opportunities have now passed. The other bit is around the friction we get is around the difference between what we want people to do and what they actually do. And our, our, our natural reaction, our unhelpful reaction, is again to put... Um, minimize the opportunities to stifle people to take more of a a command and control and micromanagement process and then we have the the difference between what we'd like to do and um what we'd like to know and what we actually know and this is the knowledge gap this is knowing that we're we're finite as human beings we we don't have all the information so we confuse um, not, uh, information with knowledge. And uh, what that does is causes paralysis because we're waiting for that perfect information to give us the answers to the problem we have. But those, that perfect information may exist, but information is vast. And we, can't, uh, we don't have the capacity or the time to really take all that information and do it. We need to get into the point of where we can um, allow people to, um, who are closer to the problem to sense make and provide that clarity, that context that we need. And really around this is that really unhelpful reaction that, that as soon as chaos happens, we move away from where we're most valuable and we get down into the, um, the tactical side. Leaders move away from where they needed to be and they start getting involved in detail. But the more that you get involved into the detail, you're missing the opportunities or the threats that are coming. So it's counterintuitive, but you need to give control to regain control. The more control you try to seize, the more that you're going to be ineffective as a leader to be able to sit back and observe. There's a classic saying that I, I love, and it was something that I had written on my notebook when I was out in command, which was eyes on, hands off. You must keep eyes on, but hands off. And there are times where you will be required to jump forward and grab that stretcher by the handle and drive the problem forward, but you need to get yourself back. You can't afford to get where we're, we're most especially if you're a technical leader where you're most comfortable and you're most comfortable sat at the problem um, dealing it. But if you're there, why, why bother hiring or why bother having these great people around you, this, this team of people that you've hired um, because they have the skills. But if you don't allow them the opportunity, how are they ever going to demonstrate they have those skills? And we are finite as people. This is definitely the era of teams and we need to embrace that. So uh, how do we then get a, empowered teams and empowered individuals? And this is where I come into, I'll talk about the hard skills of leadership now and about the balance that we ha need to have. And the first one that I'll talk about is about what, understanding what really matters, what really matters to the organisation and um, where you're going and it really gets to me the fact that I go into organizations and uh, normally because I deal with culture that they say to me can you come help me with my culture Mike I'm like yeah that's fine uh, what's your strategy and they don't have a strategy 
they don't even know where they want to get to in the next final year, uh, financial year, let alone in um, two years' time, which is you got start to see a problem. But then if you listen to what, again, is, is in social media, and I know it's quite a famous quote about um, strategy, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah, okay, nice. But if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, how are, you, how are you meant to know actually what culture you need to support that? And we need to get out of this mindset that they're separate and actually they're complementary. That you need to understand the direction to understand um, what you need in capability and what the culture you need to be. Otherwise, you're just nice people going nowhere. So the first part around uh, um, empowered teams is the understand and communicate your vision and purpose actually have that strategy and it's not corporate nonsense that i hear a lot of the time that's just corporate nonsense mike it's not it's corporate nonsense when it sits on the wall and it looks shiny and the only person that pays notice to it is the cleaner when they're cleaning the walls and they're seeing it and knocking the dust off it and everybody else has walked past it it's you need to bring it to life you need to communicate it at every level and this is a skill to give direction is a good, is a, 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 a tough skill to grasp, but when you do it, it is powerful. And you do it by keeping it simple. You inspire those on the thing. I'm not talking about the soapbox, Tony Blair trying to inspire people. It's around um, getting that a, a emotional connection to what they do on a daily basis and how that works to the common goal. Create shared ownership. People talk about why do we have silos? Well. There's no, you haven't created a shared ownership of what the organization is trying to achieve. And then uh, the final one is about reading back. It's getting that acknowledgement because we looked around a friction around actions about what people um, do against what you want them to do or the alignment gap. And that's because we've not taken into the different emotions and the stresses and personalities and individual agendas of people. And what we do is we communicate this at every level uh, we communicate what we're trying to achieve and we get them to um, read back to us actually how they are to achieve it. And that's what you want. You want people to understand how they are to do it and that then gets replicated to the tactical level so that everyone understands that by coming into the organisation or coming into this team, I know that what I do on a daily basis, I can draw a dot to it um, all the way to what we're trying to achieve. And I understand what we're trying to achieve. It's no longer corporate nonsense. It's the very fabric of what we're trying to do and we create a shared ownership to achieving it. The next one is around creating a shared consciousness. I've already started alluding to it and there's three areas around that. So shared consciousness is the understanding of the context um, of, of what we're trying to achieve and the challenges we're treat, uh, achieving. It gives people that um that wider understanding and you get that through first shared knowledge and that's moving away from our silo storage of working and actually working on how do we create a one single truth how do we create an unobstructed view or access to information that is readily available up to date and um and useful but what we we tend to do is we see knowledge uh, or information as power and the most frustrating thing to people is that they didn't have that information available to them at the time they're working old old information the second one is around understanding the bigger picture the context you need to provide that context in the in the in a cadence so the more complex or more chaotic or um uh, volatile the the um the environment you're operating in, then the more you, you need to communicate. But it's not about um, more, but it's all about the quality of communication. If you're quite a steady organization and you're working a lot of time in the obvious space, then you can have a, a, a wider cadence of communication. But throughout COVID, I'd expect you to have quite a, a, a tight cadence of communication. And it's not on about, um, to see how people are it's about actually what are the challenges we faced in what is the direction we go in 
what are the opportunities, what are the threats that are happening at the moment, and you're giving people that wider cognitive understanding of what the problem is. You're giving them the situational awareness of the organisational and the external challenges. And then the other one is transparency of uh, other teams, providing an unobstructed uh, access to what other teams are doing. And by doing this, you, you are creating that shared consciousness. And with doing that, you are, one, you're having a um, concentration and economy of effort. You're not wasting resources. Resources are finite. And they're wondering why the, um, we're, we're running out of resources, we don't have enough resources, because we're not, we're not looking at actually what is the priority what are we trying to achieve? I'm not resourcing that priority effectively and teams are going off and doing their own thing. And actually we could create a more transparency. We could start sharing that knowledge a bit more, build that familiarity with the teams so that we can actually share the resources and we can prevent this economy of effort, which drains time, it drains money. It just causes frustration uh, amongst the teams. And then it's around decentralized uh, decision-making. Remember that strategy isn't just a, a thing to stuck on a wall and aspire to. Strategy is a decision-making framework. It enables people to understand and make decisions from when things change. So you need to set the conditions for teams of individuals to make um, decisions in line with the intent, constraints and freedoms imposed. And they won't get that unless they understand what we're trying to achieve. They won't understand that if they don't understand the context, but then you then need to um, give them the freedom and constraints to, to work with. So what are the constraints that the hard lines they do not cross and what are the, the freedoms? Think about some simple rules to help them. For instance, a simple rule if you're a private organisation, maybe around um, customer satisfaction before profits. It's very simple, but that aids the decision making. They, they, they understand the problem because they are closest to it and they can react. If we don't have those, then what happens is they can't make that decision. They feel like they can make that decision and it then just goes back up the chain and we then get this really slow process in what we're doing. And then the, one, uh, the final one around that is, is really giving them support. That's build the trust and development. And what this is about is understanding that failure doesn't, failure is not black and white. It sits on a continuum between acceptable and unacceptable failure. And actually, what are we trying to do when we support those, creating a learning environment um, around um, what actually are we trying to achieve? And we want people to be innovative. And we look at the Kniffen framework on that chaotic and complex. That is all around acting. We need to act. We need to act and sense what's going on. We need people to use initiative, try something new, but they're not going to do that if, if the mental map around there is we can't make a mistake because we'll get hammered. Can't make a mistake because um, I'm going to get fired or I'm going to get embarrassed because we don't understand failure. The other one is round feedback. The amount of organisations I go into and they, they, they fear feedback. They fear uh, giving it, they fear receiving it, but it's the, it's the learning tool. Uh, we, we can't objectively see our own behaviour like others can. So without feedback, how could we actually learn? And then foster accountability, and this needs to be at every level. And this is, again, with feedback, is something that I continuously see missing in organisations. Uh, and there's a lot to accountability, but the main things that I always see dis missing is clear expectations about what we're actually trying to do to achieve, what's the success standards, and then also is around the consequences. There's never any consequences. And by understanding what failure is, then you can understand what consequences there are. And there needs to be consequences because with all this stuff we're talking about around psychological safety to be able to uh, make decision, that relies on good standards. And Again, we need to understand with all this, what is the priority so we can resource it and give people the support and the resources needed to. Because we know when they've given a task and they don't feel that they 
um, got the support or the resources or the information, then that's when neuroticism increases and um, they will tend to, that's where you start going into maybe chronic stress or they tend to resist what you're actually trying to get them to do. So it really is about understanding what matters and giving them support to achieve that. It's not just about words. Words won't get you, it's a mix between the behavior and the hard skills of leadership. So when we talk about actually what skills of leadership do we need, there's a common um, thread of the skills that are all underpinned by um, self-awareness. Our first one is about self-competence. Self-competence, not to be confused with confidence. Self-competence is an attribute of confidence. But it's the extent when you feel that you have the, the necessary skills to succeed. And what we tend to find is people that have the competence, we haven't had the, the, the training at the appropriate time or levels in that position to have the competence. We know that every time you come to a new role or situations, your competence will, will, will dip and ebb and flow. But you need to have that self-belief that you can do it. Otherwise, you will start um, projecting yourself inwards and listening to your self-talk, which is then going to increase your, your anxiety. Next one is around curiosity. Curiosity or having the learnability enables you to go out your comfort zone, ask those difficult questions, refute the evidence that's available to you. And more importantly, when working in those chaotic and complex times is refute your own assumptions. The worst thing you can do when going into those complex times is just believe that what you've done before will work again. Because we know that actually that's not going to happen. That's why it's complex and why it's chaotic, because what, what generally might have worked before is not going to have the same effect. So we need to have curiosity to, to refute those and also the curiosity to engage with our people and to ask uh, them the, the open questions we need to help start to um, engage their muscle, uh, their cognitive muscle into actually thinking for themselves. Then what um, really helps curiosity uh, or, or, or is this is helped by curiosity is tactical humility it's it enables leaders to be aware of their limitations what they know and what they don't know and actually it's about having the the understanding the self-awareness that i have limitations as a leader i am not perfect and that um, i can engage with my team because why why bother having these people here if I can't engage them and involve them in the problem and um, get that collective effort towards the problem. But a, a, a thing to this is that we're not measured by that as leaders. As leaders still in organisations, we measure leaders off of them coming up with the answers, about them being the single source of truth. And God forbid the leader doesn't have the answer because that means they're not competent. And we need to change that narrative and actually realise that we, we are the area teams. We need leaders to lead and give that direction and support that we need. But when it comes to problems, it, it's a shared problem. And that's why we need to start creating that shared consciousness. And then the fourth one is around emotional stability or neuroticism. Nikita loves it when I bring up neuroticism. And uh, it's about what, what leaders need to stay calm and focused. Because when you start dipping over to the, the, the left-hand side of the um, Kniffin framework, where you're into the disorder, the, the complex and chaotic, it is overwhelming. And leaders will feel overwhelmed. Your people will feel overwhelmed. But you as leaders, you need to stay calm and focused. Otherwise, you'll project your anxiety onto others and you can make that um, situation a lot worse. Your followers, uh, like I said, the follower-leader relationship's hardwired. And you need to be that beacon of calm. You need to contain that motion to show that what they're going through, there is a possibility that we're going to get out here fine. And I saw this a lot in Afghanistan with us around. The situation is tough, but it's not a place for me to have a meltdown just as about as we're, as we're about to go forward um, and engage. We need to keep that calm, but we do have a limit on our containment and we need to find a way that we can um, have a support network to release that stress and that emotion, um, but not uh, projecting it onto our followers. Another one is around empathy 
It allows leaders to connect with even a human. No one wants a leader that is a robot, but then it's a balance. We need also leaders that are logical as well, because we, we can't be far too on the other end. But people want to know that they can connect with you on a human level and that they can trust you and that you do have their best interests at heart. And then the final one is around ethical leadership. And this is also important as leadership level, but also organizational level. The fact that you remain ethical and moral and keep the interests and welfare of others as a priority. You do not take advantage of the vulnerable. And we're already seeing this through how connected we are in the organization uh, in, around the world, that um, the, the slight hint of unethical behavior could um, overnight destroy a well-established organization. You're going to have to look in the news today with H&M and actually the involvement in Ergen Muslims um, who, who created some of their things, so that's, uh, their, their clothesware. So straight away, that's a massive thing that could end an organisation straight away. You only have to look at about some of the stuff like President Trump, God bless him, with some of the comments he made that may, may perceive not ethical. What a dramatic effect that can have. So we need to make sure that we are ethical to our people and we look after them. And then, um, so back to my point that we were talking about, actually, is it um, a different type of leadership we need? And I argue it's not. We've always had these. It's just that the lacking of them only amplifies the shortfalls. And that if we're going to start uh, moving through this complexity and chaos, because it's not going to go away, this stability that people hope and pray for is not going to happen that actually we need to start investing in, um, in the skill of leadership as well, along with the, uh, the, the emotional side, the attributes of leadership I spoke about. And it needs to be a balance. And we need to maintain that balance because if we don't, we are going to struggle to engage people and to give people not only the emotional support and the, 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 the things, the belonging that they need, but they're not going to have that direction to... Um, understand or have a framework to be able to make um, decisions in a difficult and complex time. Thank you very much.